Hi, and welcome to part two in our 13-part series, Walking Through the New Testament Book of Luke. We're exploring this gospel and really trying to learn to apply the truths that we find in those passages uh, that we explore every week. Today, we're going to continue in chapter one, and specifically, we'll be looking at verses 26 through 38. So, get your Bible, uh, maybe some uh, paper and a pencil or pen, be ready to take some notes, and certainly, you'll need a cup of coffee uh, as we settle in and explore these passages today. You know, it's the Christmas season. You see the tree uh, behind me here in my office at the house, and, and it's a time that most of us really look forward to. We look forward to being with friends and, and family and celebrating uh, Jesus' birth, but we all know that it can also be a time of stress and a time of, of loneliness. It's actually possible to find ourselves in a crowd of people and still feel lonely. The good news of the gospel, however, is that God has a place for everyone in his redemptive plan. He uses ordinary people in that plan. Mary's story reminds us that God invites people to be part of bringing about the redemption of his creation. Just as John the Baptist served to prepare the way for Jesus, even so, his birth announcement forms the framework for the Annunciation to Mary about Jesus' birth. Mary's encounter with Gabriel came between the angel's announcement to Elizabeth and the birth of John. You know, as adults, John pointed to Jesus and proclaimed him to be the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. The two stories contain a lot of similarities and important differences. Both narratives involve an angelic proclamation about a child's birth before either women had conceived. Both Mary and Elizabeth were not in circumstances conducive to having a baby. Elizabeth was past the age of normal childbearing years, and Mary had never engaged in sexual relations. Both situations require divine intervention, and that's exactly what we see in this story. Now, at the same time, each story is unique. One announcement was made to a man, Zechariah, the other to a woman, Mary. One child was born to a married couple. The other would be born to Mary, the espoused wife of Joseph. Mary and Joseph had not consummated their marriage, and that generally happens a year after the espousal. Interestingly, the first part of the story focused on Zechariah and mentions Elizabeth only as she uh, rejoices to know that she has conceived a child. The last part of the narrative uh, has to do with Elizabeth's delivery of John. It moves quickly to Zechariah's confirmation of John's name, the release of the priest's speech, and his hymn of praise to God for what the Lord would do through this child. Now, in between these segments, Mary's story emerges as the focal point of the entire chapter. Mary was taken by surprise at the angelic visitation and even more so at the news that she would have a baby. She certainly could not have imagined that her child would be the promised Messiah. So let's begin looking at, these, at this passage. Luke chapter 1, we're going to read verses 26 and 27. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man who was named, whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Normally, scripture references uh, to a certain month involved a month as it relates to a certain year. In verse 26, the phrase in the sixth month referred to Elizabeth's pregnancy. Luke had already introduced the angel Gabriel in the earlier part of his letter to Theophilus, and just as the angel appeared to Zechariah with a message from God, even so, Gabriel reappeared with the most important news in history. He was sent by God. Theophilus may have been surprised that, that God would be interested in a place like Nazareth, and so Luke just simply identified it as a town in Galilee. 
So continuing his introduction of the participants in this, uh, in this story, Luke identified Joseph and Mary. Now notice how Luke made a point of emphasizing vital messianic issues in this short verse. Gabriel was sent to a virgin. Over seven centuries earlier, Isaiah prophesied that a virgin would bear a child who would be known as God with us, Emmanuel. This particular virgin was engaged. Now, the Hebrew concept involved a much different relationship than modern engagements. A couple went through a wedding ceremony and were considered married, except that they did not live together or engage in marital relations for one year. After a second confirmation of the marriage, they went on to normal marital habits. Joseph was of the house of David, which meant he was of the lineage of David. To be descended from David not only involved a royal heritage, but again, prophecy mandated that the Messiah would come from David's heirs. Let's look at verses 28 and 29. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. Now, unlike Gabriel's approach to Zechariah instead of Elizabeth, the angel came to Mary. Mary was a spouse to Joseph, so it was natural that she would hear the angel's announcement first. Later, Joseph also received an angelic visitation, so he might understand the divine nature of Mary's condition. Gabriel referred to Mary as favored. The root word is the same as grace. Mary's selection as the mother of the Messiah was due to God's gracious favor toward her. The angel declared, the Lord is with you. This phrase did more than just describe God's presence. It also emphasized God's favor to grace her with his purpose, not just his presence. We might think that Mary would be happy that a supernatural being declared that God had taken special notice of her and given her his favor. However, Mary was incredibly troubled by this news. The phrase described an experience of, of severe stress. She was wondering at the nature, really, of, angels, of the angel's greeting. The word wondering translates uh, a word involving reflective reasoning. She's, she's struggling with this whole announcement, trying to come to grips, trying to understand what this would mean and certainly why. And that really brings us to the first key understanding of this passage so important. And that's this. God places people in positions to be used by him. Mary's role in history amounted more to being just a nice Jewish girl engaged to a good man. God had worked in the lives of Mary and Joseph to bring them to this crucial moment in history to accomplish his divine plan. It's important that we understand that because he is at work in our lives as well, preparing us and positioning us to accomplish his divine plan. Let's continue reading. Look at verses 30 through 33. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, there will be no end. Encouraging her to not be afraid. Gabriel used her name, Mary, as if to, to converse on a more personal level. I mean, this was big news, obviously life-changing news. The basis of her comfort lay in the fact that she had found favor with God. The angel's preliminary greeting was focused on God's favor toward Mary. And now the subject is about to deal with her role in God's plan. 
three short statements in this single sentence defined how Mary would participate in the greatest event in all of history. First, she would conceive. There's no way that we can appreciate the emotions that Mary must have felt at that statement. The time had not come for her and Joseph to consummate their marriage. She was naturally confused and concerned. Second, she would give birth to a son. Third, she would name the child Jesus. In Jewish society, a child's name usually honored someone in the family. Later, an angel would inform Joseph that the boy would be named Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. The Jews understood the phrase house of Jacob as specifically related to the nation of Israel. But the Messiah's authority, it was unlimited by geography or ethnic considerations. The statement was a direct fulfillment to Isaiah's prophecy. To have the throne of David and to reign meant that the Messiah's dominion would be vast and his kingdom would be eternal. Jesus is the promised Messiah who reigns eternally. He was not merely the Jewish champion, but in fact the Savior of the entire world. Let's continue reading with verses 34 and 35. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. You know, asking a question does not always mean to question. Zechariah had questioned God when Gabriel told him about Elizabeth having a child in her old age. He was an experienced priest who should have understood the power, the miraculous power of God. While the prophecy of John's birth was fulfilled, Zechariah paid the price of doubt by being mute until John was born. In contrast, when Mary heard the amazing news about her bearing the Messiah, she naturally was puzzled. She was probably very young and naturally asked, how can this be? Notice the difference in how the angel responded to Mary. While the angel rebuked Zechariah for his doubt, he responded to Mary's innocent question. The answer was, was couched in terms that did not give specific details, but emphasized the that the conception would occur as a result of divine intervention. The Holy Spirit was present at the beginning of creation and functions in many ways in the lives of believers then and now. We should never be surprised that God the Spirit would be greatly involved in the birth of God the Son. Look at verse 36. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. To illustrate God's miraculous work, the angel told Mary to consider her relative Elizabeth. The term relative literally means someone who is born with. In other words, a kinsperson, a relative. The exact relationship is not really nearly as important as the fact that Elizabeth was childless. Mary knew that Elizabeth had exceeded the age of childbearing and did not ever expect her to become a mom. She never expected Elizabeth to become a mother. And yet in her old age, Elizabeth had indeed conceived a son. When Gabriel appeared to Mary, Elizabeth was in her sixth month. So word of her condition probably had reached Mary and others in the family. Look at verse 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. The point for Mary was that just as God had become a mirac had done a miraculous work in giving Elizabeth a child, God could accomplish his purpose through Mary. 
Mary's question about how she could have a child without intimate relations with a man focus on human possibilities. And we're all so guilty of that so often. We focus, we get locked into what's humanly possible. We tend to consider what the potential in terms of how the known laws of nature work. Like Mary, we need to recognize the limitless power of God. The angel reminded Mary and us that nothing will be impossible with God. We may not understand how the eternal Christ, who was present in eternity past, could be conceived in human form within a virgin's womb. We may wonder at the miracle of the Christmas story. However, we can rejoice that God's infinite power accomplished his plan of salvation and made it possible for us to be reconciled to him through Jesus. Now, finally, let's look at verse 38. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Mary yielded to the Lord's plan. And we need to understand that the implications of her response, may it happen to me, as you have said. She accepted that the word that the angel spoke was a message from God. Hers was not just some stoic surrender of, of someone who had no choice. Rather, it was the embrace of the master and his purpose in her life. Brings us to our second key understanding today. Just like Mary, believers are to submit humbly to God's purposes. He desires to accomplish so much through each of us, if we will simply trust him and allow him to fulfill his will through us for his glory. If we simply trust him. Do you trust him today? I hope that as you pray, that you're praying that God would increase your trust in him for his purposes in your life. We're so thankful for the Christmas season and the opportunity to worship, uh, whether that is worship uh, via video or worshiping in person. We are gathering uh, every week at Valley Grove. So if you're in the Seymour, South Knoxville area, we would encourage you and invite you to come and worship with us. Uh, you can see our uh, address. You can see our worship schedule online. You'll see online or you'll see on your screen now uh, all the ways that you can uh, reach out to us and engage with us including through social media. And we would certainly welcome to engage with you there on uh, any of our social media platforms. We also have a number that you can call, you can text questions about this video, questions about our study, questions about our church, uh, or maybe just to reach out to us and ask that we be praying with you, praying for you. So regardless of how you see all those mentioned on screen, we are here for you. We know that ministry today looks very different than it has ever looked. But we are making ourselves, we want to make ourselves available to you to minister to you and your family in any way possible. So we're through this uh, second uh, part in this 13-part series, exploring the gospel, the first half of the gospel of Luke. Uh, we look forward again to being with you in just a few days again for part three. So you be ready. Take a look at chapter two because that's where we're headed next. And you be ready as we meet again. And until then, I can't wait to see you again really soon. Have a great day and the rest of your week. We'll see you soon.